And the uh, last speaker who has been partially introduced already is uh, Jeff Simpson. Jeff, come on up. I think we can all give Jeff a nice warm round of applause. He has served for 12 consecutive years as editor of the middle section of JPSP, including the last six years as the lead editor of that section. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you for that <clears throat> nice introduction. and. Uh, <clears throat> On behalf of the entire panel, I want to thank uh, Cheryl and Eli for arranging this uh, session. I think it's very important, and uh, I am glad I am here. Um, let me get this started here. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about something that's been on my mind for a long time, certainly since I was in graduate school, and that is um, where do situational dimensions fit into our thinking and our science? I think we need to think more. This is the basic punchline. We need to think more about the primary situational dimensions that define the things that we study, and we need to situate our manipulations within situational space so we can more clearly understand what we're manipulating and also what we're not manipulating. Um, so I'm just going to raise a few key points and then try to uh, unpack them as we go along. Uh, I'd, I'd like to make the argument that we don't make sufficient use of major situation taxonomies in our research. We do at times, but not, not enough. We sometimes manipulate variables without really knowing what they measure and what they mean to participants, especially when we're using new manipulations for the first time that have not been uh, tested in different kinds of contexts. We focus a great deal on internal and face validity of experimental manipulations, but we often pay short shrift to construct validity. This is a point uh, that Paul Meal and uh, Lee Kronbach made many, many years ago. Um, I think one of the things that we can do to improve our science is to report where manipulations exist within theoretically relevant construct space and also in relation to each other. And do that on a, 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 on a much more regular basis, either by looking at the way people, our participants, perceive situations or having observers who are trained uh, to dif differentiate them and locate them in situational space. And I'll give you a, a quick example of that in a few minutes. And I think that if we did some of these things, especially again with uh, new, newer manipulations that uh, aren't fully tested, uh, doing so could help us understand why certain manipulations either do or don't work, uh, especially for different kinds of people with different kinds of developmental or relationship histories. Chemistry's got the periodic table, uh, and they've gone a long way with that in part because they know what the basic elements are, they know how the basic elements can be combined, and there's a finite number of things they have to study. It's not a, a hum humongous number of different kinds of elements. Even in personality, we have the big five, or six, or three, or four, and they're facets. Um, but the big five allows us to kind of focus on a small number of things. We can bring in situations and look at person-by-situation interactions, as Michelle and Shoda and others have done, but it's a tractable, manageable structure. So if you think about the definition of social psychology, and this is a kind of a, a version of what Gordon Alport said in his famous 1935 definition, we study the actual imagined or implied presence of others in different situations and how these situations in turn affect how people think and feel and behave. That's a pretty core definition I think most people would agree with, but the question then uh, that's raised is what are our core taxonomies of situations? Do we have core taxonomies? Is it possible for us to come to, to identify what they are? And I would argue, at least in the context of interpersonal situations, we do have taxonomies. Uh, we do have things that uh, we could turn to to situate and locate our manipulations. And one of the best summaries of this area in the last few years was a book written by Harold Kelly and his colleagues about 10 years ago, The Atlas of Interpersonal Situations. And in that book, what they tried to do is to take a look at uh, the literature and also their theory and try to figure out what were some of the core situations that define our field. And they came up with basically four uh, core ones. So situations differ, at least interpersonal situations, in terms of whether or not they're positive or negative, whether or not the interactants are cooperative or antagonistic. They differ in the degree of interdependence versus independence of the people involved in the situation. Uh, they differ in terms of the predictability or unpredictability of the situation. Is it a, a, a strong situation that's very clearly rule or norm governed, or is it more of a weak situation that is a bit more amorphous and without structure? And situations also uh, differ in terms of the power or status of the interactants. Is the power or status equal, 
or is it unequal? There certainly are probably more than four dimensions, but these are four that they've identified. And we actually do have some, some existing taxonomies in some of our sub areas that contain at least two or three of these four uh, different kinds of dimensions. So the problem, as I already mentioned real briefly, at least this is my view, is that we rarely locate experimental manipulations within the theoretical space of major situational dimensions in the given area that we're studying. And so what we do is we sometimes unwittingly create manipulations without knowing what's being manipulated, exactly what's being manipulated, and uh, what the manipulations mean to different kinds of people, not just people in general and a generic kind of response, but to different kinds of people with different kinds of developmental histories, different kinds of personalities, different kinds of needs and motives. And this problem becomes really compounded when you begin to, um, by, by, by our focus on both the internal and uh, face validity of our manipulations. So we're a, we're a very internally validity focused field when you think about it. All of us were raised on uh, the definition of internal validity that Cook and Campbell wrote about in their method, uh, methodology book back in the 1970s and 1980s. And the definition from that book of internal validity is it's the validity with which statements can be made about whether there's a causal relationship from one variable to another in the form in which the variables were manipulated or measured. And if you look at this definition very carefully, it doesn't tell us hardly anything about what the manipulation is ex assessing. It just indicates that it is reliably producing some sort of causal effect. And so what we often do is we turn to either face or predictive validity to try to infer indirectly what a given manipulation is measuring. And if we run many, many studies, we eventually have a large enough set of findings that we can kind of figure out exactly what a manipulation is assessing. But what's happened recently in our field is we create these uh, manipulations du jour, so to speak, uh, and we try to use them to triangulate on a given outcome without knowing subtle differences sometimes between the different manipulations that we think might be measuring exactly the same thing. And this is especially problematic when you are doing conceptual replications. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, I hope, I get, believe you can read this. So this, the first part, uh, this is a, a, a possible mating prime that you can give to a participant in a study. And the, uh, the first part is actually from a mating prime that's been published uh, in uh, a standard journal in our field. And the part in blue is what I added in my Harlequin romance uh, phase um, to make a point here. So imagine that you're a, a female and you're heterosexual and uh, you're given the following prime. As the evening goes on, you realize that you're having an absolutely wonderful time with John and he is feeling the same way. He suggests that after dinner you should go for a walk along the beach and watch the sunset. You have been dreaming about some, someone asking you that very question all week. And then it continues. As you stroll onto the sand, you talk about some of the things you have in common. He softly reaches for your hand and smiles. He gently squeezes his hand and your eyes suddenly meet. You feel a rush of emotions. He draws closer to you. His body feels warm and you put your head on his shoulder. Okay, you might be trying to manipulate uh, or prime mating here, but you're priming a certain kind of form of mating for a certain kind of person at some level. And we do have a taxonomy uh, in personality and relationship science that contains two of the four dimensions that Kelly had all talked about, affiliation uh, or warmth and love and uh, power or dominance versus submission, basically. And so if you think about this first mating prime, uh, Mr. I want to share the love, for example, where would this prime fit within the space either rated by observers or reported by participants? It's an empirical question, right? But my guess is that they would probably fit more along the higher end of the affiliation access axis and maybe mi middle range part of the power axis, potentially. So you think you've m manipulated and primed mating, but you've really primed a certain kind of mating. Then you do a second study. You give one a prime mating, study two. The first part of the prime is identical to the last one, so the part in black is the same. But this time, you kind of want to twist things up because you want to conceptually replicate it. And so the, the part in red reads as follows. Uh, as you stroll onto the sand, you talk about some of the important things he has done in his life. He confidently reaches for your hand and smiles. You squeeze his hand and your eyes meet suddenly. You feel a rush of emotions. He pulls you closer to him. His strong body feels warm. And uh, you put your head on his broad shoulder. Okay? This is Mr. 
make the love as opposed to share the love, basically. And if you were to ask uh, women uh, how they perceive this man in the situation, or maybe raiders, you might find that you're in a different part of the two-dimensional space of the interpersonal circumplex, even though you think you are priming a mating motive. Why is this important? Well, oftentimes primes work differentially for different kinds of people. So the, the blue prime, the Mr. Uh, I want to share my love with you, uh, the more communal oriented person is going to probably be more appealing. That prime will work better for someone who is more of a restricted sociosexual orientation or wants a long-term relationship. Whereas the Mr. I want to make love uh, prime is maybe more effective for women who have more of a short-term orientation or, or who are more unrestricted in terms of their sociosexuality. So it's really important um, to not only understand where a manipulation falls within theoretically relevant situational space, it's also important to know where different manipulations fall in relation to each other because you can sometimes figure out and explain where, why you are or not getting certain kinds of effects for certain kinds of people. Now there are researchers who actually do this uh, on a regular basis. They'll do a manipulation and they'll say, well, this manipulation should work better for these people than these people given their other, the other motives they may have. So some of, this, some of this kind of thinking is already in some of our research, but one of the problems is, is we often treat um, the variation uh, in how people perceive different kinds of manipulations as largely error, when some of that variation actually is probably real true effect variance that could be modeled if you had a good theoretical angle on what the motives of different people in your study are all about. Um, there are other examples. The interpersonal circumplex is just one. There's a circumplex model of emotions. I think it's important when you uh, do manipulations to at least understand whether or not people view it as uh, pleasant versus unpleasant or arousing versus unarousing. That can tell you an awful lot not only about the effectiveness of your manipulation potentially, but certainly the extent to which it has similar kinds of psychological emotional effects uh, on participants. And now, some caveats really, really briefly. Some manipulations in our field are less vulnerable to these problems because their construct validity is, is very well understood or because it's just easier to figure out or infer what they actually measure. So I ask a bunch of experts in the field, uh, people, uh, colleagues, close colleagues, uh, what, are, what they thought were the best validated manipulations in social psychology. Uh, and here's the list that I got from uh, about four or five different experts in the field. So there are some tried and true manipulations uh, of various kinds that probably are a lot more construct valid than others. I'm not harping on these more tried and true manipulations necessarily that are very, very well studied. I'm focusing more on the let's, you know, let's conjure up a manipulation and try it five different ways and then assume we're measuring the same thing. That's the problem that I think we're facing as a field right now um, without really having a really clear handle on what these various manipulations are really getting at for different kinds of people. And when you don't know that, you have a science where replication becomes a lot more difficult. So in summary, I would argue that we need to do four things. We need to think beyond the internal face and predictive validity of our experimental manipulations. We need to focus more on their construct validation properties, their convergent and discriminant correlates in particular. Um, we need to also understand where manipulations reside both within some theoretically relevant uh, construct space, be it the interpersonal circumplex or the two-dimensional model of emotions or whatever is the, the situ relevant space within your field, and also how manipulations reside relative to each other. And I think we also need to pay a lot more attention to modeling individual differences that may explain why certain people are more versus less um, impacted or influenced by certain manipulations in our studies. Thank you. Okay, uh, I would love for the four speakers to uh, come to the front, if you're willing. Um, we do have uh, 10 minutes or more for uh, Q&A time. Uh, what we'll ask of the audience is, um, there are some microphones in the middle, so uh, either project really loudly or come to one of the microphones. 
Um, also, we'll ask you to keep your questions on the brief side. I know that uh, our panelists will do their best dealing with complex issues to do so efficiently so that we can get at least three to five different questions. Um, I will uh, get the ball uh, rolling. I've had one uh, question that has, um, I think, been relevant to this issue, and I'd love to get uh, the feeling of one or more members of the panel, um, which is, um, how, how great a crisis has the field been facing? So if we look before we really started doing the, the large lifting to try to address the issue over the last several years and think of the field circa 2008 or 2010, uh, if I, in one extreme you might imagine that, that there are no effects that are real in the published literature, that, that it's sort of all the, you know, when I'm 64 you can sort of make anything significant if you use the standard p-hacking sorts of procedures. On the other extreme you might say that, sure, everybody's been p-hacking or large swaths of the field have been p-hacking, myself included, but really people only think to p-hack when p is 0.07, right? That they run it, it's 0.07, and then they're like, oops, I forgot, I should be thinking about an outlier. And I asked this question because I, because it feels to me that the solutions to the problem differ as a function of do we have a very fundamental deep issue where it's really unclear whether there are truths in the field and if so what they are, or is the issue a smaller one, albeit still a significant one, which is the functional p-value of 0.05, alpha of 0.05, is really closer to 0.07 or 0.09 or 0.15 or something like that. Does anybody want to chime in on that? Maybe Yuri, do you want to start us? Or anybody else? Does this work? Yeah. So there's definitely guesswork in answering that question. Yeah. Um, so first, the optimistic part. The optimistic answer would be w one title that we thought about for this talk was the replication crisis is over. And, and, and the way in which the replication crisis is over is that we're having these conversations. People are running replications. People are, it's like science is leading the way, requiring disclosure. And that is, that is going good science. And we are leading the way. We're, there are meeting where political scientists and economists and other, other fields are looking up to psychology to learn how they can improve their fields. And in that sense, we're past the bad part. That's the positive side. The, the negative side, it, it's hard to really know how much of what we think is true is true. But there, there are, I think there are good empirical reasons to be, to be worried that a substantial share is, is not true. And Although it's, it's, it's nice to think about our pride, pride is not such a big deal. We, we know from, from the other things that Mazari mentioned, and, 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 and we all know about human behavior, that we shouldn't be too reassured by our intuit, intuitions as to how much is true. And so I think, I, th I think there's, there's good, okay, so here's, here's an example that's extremely concrete. When we, when we wrote uh, this paper on Peaker, which is a, it's a technique to assess if a set of studies have evidential value, one task was to define a set of studies that had definitely no, no any, any element of p-hacking. And we ended up selecting from JPSB studies that had no key, no word in the, in the text that would be related in any way to p-hacking. So the word exclusion wasn't there, the word covariate wasn't there. I'm not saying those things signal p-hacking, I'm saying if you're p-hacking, that's how you would do it. And the resulting set of super clean kosher results had an implied power of 33%. And so even though, even though there was true evidential value there, there, there's truth there, if the best possible set, it's power 33%, I think that's reason for concern to, that maybe, maybe some things aren't true. Now I don't see that as a, as a negative thing. I think it's, it's, it's positive that we now have at least the, the will in, in a substantial share of the field to, to take ownership of the problem and we're leading the way. So I don't, I don't feel that that's bad news, but it's, I don't, th I don't think p-hacking is going from 0.08 to 0.04. I think the evidence suggests is that's not what it is. I think this conversation and the other conversations that you guys have been behind in many ways is extremely important for the field. So when I um, finished graduate school, um, they were afraid that everybody was gonna quit social psychology because there was a crisis in social psychology. That crisis back then was that we were all about internal validity and we didn't care about the real world. And then, lo and behold, other things came along, people had the conversation, it was a serious conversation, and it changed the way people approached the work that they did. It wasn't enough just to do an incredibly cute demonstration study, you had to do something more significant than that in a variety of ways, either more theoretically or practically significant. 
So I already see differences in the way I have conversations with my research collaborators. People are worried about the validity of the inferences that they're making. And so I think the conversation has, in fact, made us think harder and examine what we're doing. So I just want to sort of flag that as a value that I think is already changing what's going on. So I was going to say it would be nice if somebody older than me commented on whether this crisis is worse than the older crisis. And I don't know how they stack up, but, but we are so similar in age that, yeah. But in any case, uh, that was a crisis, and people did, did speak pretty passionately about it. I just know the one amazing paper that Bill McGuire wrote on the seven Collins, the yin and yang of social psychology, which is worth reading at any given time. But the, it, I think the, to me, this is extremely positive. I see what's happening as very similar to a new and amazing theory being introduced into the field, a new and amazing method being introduced. People are running around trying to pick it up and do something with it. And I see this very much in that vein, rather than as a crisis. I, I wish people could have heard our conversation on a really, really, really cold day in January. Um, the six of us talked for about an hour. And I think one of the messages that we wanted to communicate to everyone is that uh, this is, we do have some problems, but we also have opportunities to really improve. And we wanted our, our focus to be more constructive on what you can do realistically within your labs and how you, in terms of how you talk about research and what you value and wh where you place your attention. And I hope that's come through. I, we, we really wanted to try not to make this another complaining session, saying, you know, we're, we're really in trouble, we can't do a whole lot. And I think you could, you could tell today from some of the talks, you know, and what people were saying that really, uh, th some of the fixes are going to take some work, but they're not impossible to do, and they're not going to be too onerous as long as we uh, make an effort to try to identify what we can do uh, and work as hard as we can. Okay, uh, opening the floor. Questions uh, out there in the audience? Wave your hands high, by the way. Oh, yes, go ahead. Is this me? Oh, okay. So I guess I have two points or two comments generally. Uh, First of all, thank you for putting this on. Um, there is a great quote from Richard Feynman that I'm going to butcher, but in essence that to be a good scientist, the first principle is uh, to not be fooled, but with the caveat that you are the easiest person to fool. Um, and I feel like the conversation that we're having reminds us of that issue generally, not just within psychology, but across all of the sciences. It does happen a lot. Um, the second thing is actually far more of a focal point um, to Yuri, or at least a question. So what would you say if I were to run a pilot and then use the effect size or the whatever the regression coefficient and the standard error as a prior for my larger follow-up study afterwards? I feel like part of the conversation that we're having here about power is being limited by the fact that every single time using the classic power analysis techniques, we're assuming that the effect size goes from somewhere, could be negative infinity, could be all the way up to positive infinity. We don't know where, but it's got to be somewhere in there. Whereas if we were to take a Bayesian approach, we would then say, nah, my belief about where it's going to fall isn't at negative infinity. And it's not even close there. So. So if, if you were to take a, a Bayesian approach and, and take prior priors into account, the, the main trick would be what are those priors? Where would they come from? And so ideally, if, if, we, had, if we had 100 years worth of publication bias free reporting of effects, we could have very well informed priors as to how big an effect can a psychological manipulation have on different things. The problem is we haven't had that. So we have almost no clue as to how big any effect that we are interested in. We have some sense that some effects are true. We have no idea how big they are. And so, so if, if you were a Bayesian, you'd be forced to enter very ignorant priors to your analysis. And when you have ignorant priors, the results from the Bayesian analysis are the same as the one from the, from the frequentist. So at least at this point, we can't, maybe in 20, 50 years, if we go Bayesian, there'll be, there'll be notable improvements. But for the time being, that they're uh, mostly philosophical. Next, next question from the audience. Please, come on up.
Actually, you know, uh, while she's getting up to a, a microphone, if you know that you'd like to ask a question, feel free to join, uh, stand up next to one of the microphones in the audience. So I love that we are talking about this within ourselves. This is important group learning and discussing and all that. How should we change the way we discuss our research with the non-science public, with our new students, with the press, to kind of keep this idea going, this idea that we're focused on integrity, that we're making these changes? Are you directing that to anyone in particular? To Just That's why I included some slides and some remarks about export, because I think that we have to be responsible about what we export. Many of us do the research that we do because we think it has policy implications, and we care about making the world a better place. But we can't responsibly recommend anything to anybody unless we have a really high bar of belief in it, and it can't just come from your lab. It has to come from you know, a variety of people and a consensus and some of the gold standards that I was talking about. So I think that that's really important before we go public and share our ideas about how to run things. Uh, but I think in terms of the integrity of us as a field, there's no evidence that we're worse than anybody else. I mean, every field, every professional field that exists has you know, a tiny fraction of bad actors. You can't police those people away. They will do it anyway. They will find ways. People who are going to fabricate data are going to fabricate insurance reports. They're going to fabricate, you know, whatever, in whatever field they're in. That part, I don't think that we can make it go away. But I do think that by having these conversations that we are, in fact, um, setting a standard for other fields, and they're paying attention to us. Um, I'll just say that, you know, I, I, I do think that Susan is absolutely right, that we, we may actually be better than most fields. Um, and not because we're better people, but because maybe the stakes are much higher for them. So I think if you are in biology, um, and your job is inventing new drugs, and there are pharmaceuticals that are funding you, uh, to the tune of millions of dollars to show that something that they want to invest in is the right drug. I just think the pressures on them are very high, and the data bear that out. Just go any old day to the Office of Research Integrity's website and look at this month's people who have been, uh, you know, whose jobs have been taken away because they conducted fraudulent work or whose papers have, you know, been shown to not have accurate data or plagiarized. And you know, you'll see that it all comes from a particular part of the world. It's biomedical work. We're not even rounding error in there. And I think one thing that adds to that is because what we do is um, more intuitive to a lot of people in the public, and the press really likes it. I mean, Valentine's Day was yesterday, and many of us were getting all kinds of calls last week. Um, I think we have to be very careful in terms of how, before we go to the media, that we really are confident that our findings replicate, because uh, there's a voracious appetite out there for a lot of what we do. They find it very interesting. They're not going to find the latest breakthrough in astrology, or astronomy or chemistry nearly as fascinating as whether or not there's a new kind of drug that does wonders for your love life, for example. So I think part of it is on us to be very careful before we go out and talk, because people will digest our information maybe more rapidly and more voraciously than they will other fields. So I think that's all the time we have for this session. Obviously, it's one conversation in a massive, massive, very important dialogue. Um, and I'd like to, once again, on behalf of Cheryl and me, thank all of the speakers, thanks to the audience as well. Hopefully, uh, we're continuing to figure it out and leading the way among the sciences. Thanks to everybody.